please welcome Kevin Russell. Thank you, Cody, for this event. <laughs> See a lot of my friends here. It's been a wow, crazy adventure to get here. So I guess I'll give you a short overview of like kind of like how I got here and like why I feel optimism is a responsibility for us. Um, kind of started. Um, I started the Techno Optimist podcast like six years ago, and then I was picked up by Serious Wonder, and then uh, that's that's evolved into. I got flown out to Dubai to give a speech out there, and then they picked me up on the team and we're making SciFest into a global event. And so our first one we're gonna be running, this is the first announcement of it, which is the Night of Wonder, and we're gonna be integrating like uh, the IBM Watson, um, they're using it for a chef, so we're gonna have a, a dinner theater type event where there'll be speakers and then we'll have the algorithmically inspired food and whatnot for that. Um, and then jumping forward. All right, so I guess it really started, I was, uh, I think, 20, yeah, I was 25. I was running an internet cafe down in San Diego. I got really unhealthy. It was nothing but hot pockets and energy drinks. And I got up to about 400 and something pounds. At that stage, you step on a scale, and they usually only go up to 280, right? And so after it, like, went over a couple times, I, uh, well, you lose count, right? So I left that all and I went up to Alaska, actually my dad who's here and my, my nephew Caden as well. Um, we had an opportunity to go up and the family was gonna maybe buy a gold mine but they wanted to make sure that uh, it was profitable so I was sent up there to do the research and to work on it for a summer. But we got up there and it was, the ground was still too frozen, went up in March and so ended up with like, there was no generator, no electricity, there was, I mean it was, it was hard living up there. But I was able to bring a ton of books with me and without any internet, you know, to funnel me through Reddit. And I, I was actually able to like digest the information without anybody telling me what to digest. And so I had a very eclectic, you know, um, diverse range of philosophers and, and authors that, that were inspiring me. So with that, while I was up there, I, I was raised Mormon and I didn't really have the techniques of meditation. Uh, like I understood prayer stimulated that same sort of thing. But what I grew up with was, was computers. And so when I thought of what, what I was doing with my meditation, it was the control alt delete. And so when I sat there, I would pull up my system processes. I would see what programs were limiting my cognition, limiting my ability to like emote in the world around me. And that was really, really healthy for me. And so in Alaska, it really helped me just format my mind and when I came back to the city, I, I mean, it was just, it was too much. And so this was me. I was a Mormon missionary. This was when my dad and I went out, we got to go out to Africa. I was quite bigger, as you can see. Um, and let's see. So with that, like, I saw that, well, I, I didn't want to say it because my nephew's in the room, but anyways. Uh, I deleted the slide, it was called the pharmacological format, and so I, while I was in Alaska, there was, uh, I've read a lot of Terrence McKenna, Timothy Leary, these people that I didn't have any history on, I didn't know the social taboos with them, but I saw that there was a lot of benefits to doing it in the shamanic way, and so I did all my fasting, I got back to Montana, I was there with just my labradoodles and myself, and I fasted for three or four days, I did all my control, I'll delete, made sure all of my, uh, my system programs were, were in order, and I did about five dried grams of mushrooms. And at that point, it was the first time that I felt uh, like there was no, there was only lucidity of introspection. You know, there was the hallucinations that I was having was prior to the ingestion of psilocybin. When I looked in the mirror, I saw myself as you guys would see me, not as I told myself I was which was I'll run next week or I'll get, you know, I'll start my diet next week. It was just like that. The hallucination was definitely what culture imposed on me and what I, what I was the day before the ingestion. So when I saw that, it shattered the illusion of, of what I thought I was and what I could be. 
So that night on mushrooms, I signed up for an Ironman triathlon, about 400 and I think 20 pounds was my max. And a year later, I was competing in the Ironman triathlon and doing jujitsu and yoga and all that. Um, and so that really led me into what else can I do with this information? So the quote that always stuck with me was, he who controls your eyes controls your mind. And this is when I really wanted to put that to the test. If I could change my body that much, and how could I empower people um, with somewhat of an example? And so I figured, I studied Edward Bernays, if anybody knows who that is. That was, um, there you go. Uh, that was uh, Freud's nephew, and he was the father of propaganda or public relations. And he, he constructed what I like to call the Bernaysian parasites. And these are, his first um, big contract was with the, with the tobacco industry. There was a taboo with uh, women smoking in public. And so they, they orchestrated this big event when, the, when all the war vets were coming home and there was a big parade. And so right at the end of the parade where all the media was at, they had all these debutantes lift their skirts up and they pulled out their torches of freedom and they all smoked. And since then, I mean, you can't ever like mimetically deconstruct torches of freedom. You can't say that that's a bad thing. And so, I mean, we all know what happened with smoking all the way up until very recently. So that was a Bernaysian parasite that stuck with it. So I figured the people that have like the most ability to control somebody's eyes is Fox News. And uh, they seem to be pushing out the most, um, if it bleeds, it leads media. So I, uh, I do this quite a bit. I would recommend you guys do it as well. There's a couple programs online, a couple websites. It's called futureme.com. And you can send yourself emails into the future. So I was in a really good psychological state. I had just done all this work with the Iron Man. I had done all this work with yoga, all this work with my mind. And I figured I'm in a really good place. If there's anything that would solidify my understanding of how powerful that statement is, it would be let Fox News control Fox News and Alex Jones, you know, those type of people control my, my input. So all my stimuli that I would receive from the external world would only come through those conduits. And with that, it took about three months before I was basically wearing the sign that the end was nigh. I was calling my family. I was setting up like where the geothermal locations were because the end of the world was coming. I mean, I was, I was a, a apocryphal, like it was, I was definitely a doomsdayer, and it only took about three months from, to pull me from like the most optimistic, the most healthy place, the most be best mindset that I had ever been in. Um, that's what Fox News did to me. Within, I, at six months, what I did was I got that email back from myself, and I was pissed. I was like, you're so ignorant, you don't understand, like, you don't, like the queen's a reptile, the planet Nubiru's coming, the Anunnaki are there, you know, Zacharias Hitchens, like I was there, like I believed it all, and I had the ability to articulate it, and I was bringing people with me to the end. You know, like that's, that was, um, so that's when it really showed me that optimism was our, our responsibility, and it's not just, it's not just, that, that naive wishful thinking anymore, we, we found a little cortice in the brain right, befi right behind your eyes. It's called the orbital frontal cortex. And they, sh they showed like after the tsunamis in Japan that uh, four months afterwards, they showed actually a shrinkage in this portion of the brain. So you're neuro neurologically incapable of seeing a better tomorrow. This is what PTSD stems. So if you ever have somebody in your life that is suffering from these things, their brain is actually incapable of optimism. They're incapable of having hope about tomorrow. So it's our job is to help them like a muscle to train that. Um, so like I put, pessimism is a neurological sp spyware hijacking the imagination's bandwidth. Our brains only have a very limited bandwidth that, that, it's, that it's allowed to allocate throughout the day, right? And if you don't have that portion of the brain that is, that is constantly being stimulated, you're, you're stuck, you're, you're, your bandwidth is completely throttled and it just uh, buffers. So that really led me into reframing and that's basically what I do all day now. I let anybody come to me with their pest, like I asked my nephew earlier, I said, why do you feel that tomorrow will not be better than today? And this is the question I ask every time I'm on stage, anytime I'm with somebody. And if they give me a pessimistic response, it shows that they've concluded a place in their mind, like it's neurologically lazy at that point, or it's like you haven't done the work. Like if you concluded that, that tomorrow is not gonna be better than today, then we have to 
take today to find a better solution to tomorrow's better. You know, it's like, let's keep doing the work. I'm not saying that this is like optimism is easy. I'm saying it's our responsibility to do that. Um, so basically that, that kind of, I mean, I rushed through it because, I mean, this is Bill. I wanted to get your guys' input. So I was going to put my, <laughs> he's shaking his head no. Um, so I'll just throw it out to the audience. I'll ask you guys that question and I'll help like, and maybe as a group, we can help try to reframe it, you know. So a lot of people have that dystopian nightmare. Do you have one? Okay, so why is tomorrow not going to be better than today, Dad? Oh. How would you reframe artificial intelligence? I mean, very smart people are saying this. Yeah, like oh, Elon Musk. It's Elon we're, Musk we're invoking the demon, right? Yeah. So yeah. how would you reframe that without this whole idea of fear and Apocalypse coming with artificial intelligence is very high on a lot of people's minds. Yeah, yeah. Um, John and I talk about this quite a bit. So I do, uh, my partner is John Smart. He's the futurist coming out with the foresight guide. And he is um, one of the most pragmatic and analytical people I've ever met. And he, he has this optimist and pessimism ratio. It's 70-30 and he always tries to pull my optimism back in. So when we debate about artificial intelligence, it's, this question comes up quite a bit. And him and I go back and forth. Um, I have labradoodles, right? These, are, these were wolves at one point, but we have selectively bred them and they have evolved with us to be cuddly creatures. And this is, this is something that we do. In these algorithms that we're training, we're doing that exact same process. And so, like, if you look at, like, Asimo the robot, right, versus, like, the Atlas coming out of Boston Dynamics, there's a complete polarity of them, right? But these are going to be in our homes. We're going to want to, we want, I mean, we as a species, I believe, are empathetic. We're empathetic creatures. We're, we seek for connection. And these algorithms that we're training, that we're evolving, I believe will represent our ideals and our, our values. So this actually presents, I wasn't going to get into this, but thank you for that. Um, what we're interfacing with is the sum total of human knowledge. Like, like, that's what it is. IBM Watson has the ability to um, interface with 8 million books a second, but I think that was like three years ago, so it's probably up to like 20 million books a second, right? At that point, I can't, my bandwidth for what's retained locally, I'm just gonna go ahead and listen to it as if it's the arbiter of what is, what is, what is factual out there. So with that, like the voice in my head, limited bandwidth. It's prone to all of these insecurities, it's prone to, you know, all, you know, everybody knows what their internal voice is. If it was projected out, we're all being white jackets, right? And so with that, I feel that the, that age-old question, is man good, is finally going to be able to be answered through this voice that's waking up in the cloud. And that's what these, the, the artificial intelligence is going to ask. Because every time we've asked that question before, like if you were in the 80s and you asked, are Russians good, what was the answer? There was somebody at the top that was telling you that Russians are bad, right? There, there's always, or, you know, religion, Islam's bad, or Methodists are bad, or whatever it is. There's always a centrally governing body that is answering that question, is man good for us? So for the first time in human history, that wall has come down. And with, with artificial intelligence, if you guys had seen that latest release from Skype, Skype is doing real-time translation for the past however many years they've been feeding every conversation we've had into these algorithms and now they can take real time I saw I was gonna play a video of it the kids in in some English class was speaking to these kids in China and it was taking their voices real-time translating it and they were having a conversation one in Mandarin one in English but they were hearing English on this end they were hearing Mandarin on the other end and so now there's no governing body there's no central authority that is getting in the way of asking is man good and I think that that's what we're going to be afforded. We all have these, these connections. These are all our digital colossums that allow us to bridge a connection without any walls between us. You know, there's no more, you know, primates perpetuating piss lines with bombs anymore. You know, we all have these, you know, they, uh, Amber Case, right? She's the cyber, cyber anthropologist. She says that we all experience technologically mediated telepathy. No one's in the way anymore of us asking that question. And I, it is my optimism, but I've traveled all over the world now, and wherever I go, people are good. 
They're empathetic. They just, at the end of the day, they want to hold their loved ones. They don't want to be in fear. Um, one of the things I, I put up here is de decoupling danger from fear. That's one of the things that Fox News does, is it makes you fearful of what the danger is present, right? Instead of just acknowledging the danger as it is and then making the pragmatic decisions that, that you know, tomorrow's going to be better. So artificial intelligence is a reflection of us. That's all it is. It, it's, it's feeding all of our data that we put into it. And the reflection that we're going to get back, I feel, is a reflection of our society. And I feel that humanity is good. And that question is going to be answered. There you go, Dad. The definition of artificial intelligence is that computers learn sufficient and expand sufficiently so that they become sentient beings as we are. So listening into all of our conversations and doing uh, um, analytical uh, downloads is not quite the same as sentience. I wouldn't say, so that's the big, con I mean, we, we still have the debate of what consciousness is. Like, I have to impose consciousness on you. You know, these are the, the philosophical zombie. We don't, I don't know that you're conscious. I have to just infer that. Each one of you here could be mental projections of my internal, you know, the chaos, right? So... It, th that's what, so that's what we're doing now. We're having this conversation. When I interface with Siri or I interface with Watson, I'm going to project my consciousness in it. And if it has a natural language interface that's coming back at me, I'm going to impose my consciousness on it. So again, it's just a reflection. I hope that my interactions with you guys are a reflection of my state that I'm bringing to the table. And that's what I hope with artificial intelligence as well. I don't, we will never know, I, I feel, we will never know if there's actually consciousness in the machine but it will be able to answer that, and then it's just up to us to have faith that it is, it is conscious or it is not. But if it's having a conversation with me and I'm having an interaction and I'm, I'm receiving data back and forth and it's helping me become a better person, then, then I'm, I, mean, I, I impose my consciousness on it as I do with you. So I don't, I don't think that the, the machines are gonna wake up like Kurzweil believes, you know, like, like that sort of thing. I don't think there's gonna be these conscious um, but I have, I mean, if you really want to break it down, I, I have this whole thing about um, the breakdown of my came real mind. Julian James, do you know about this? Okay, so I'll, I'll try to sum it up real quick. How much time do I have? Okay, I'll try to sum this up really quickly because it's super fascinating. So, okay, so we're talking about consciousness here, right? And it really, it's applicable to the artificial intelligence debate. So he believes, and he has a great the whole debate about this and he pulls like from Homer and the Iliad and all these things that consciousness as we experience now is not the same as it was 3,500 years ago. It was, so everything was compelled. So in the Odyssey, right, that all, all the actions that were through the characters in that were, they were compelled from the voice above, right? It was the logos in the cloud that compelled them to act, right? And then when the, when the, through the Silk Road, when the traders started going, going to different tribes, they started seeing that the voice that they were hearing was different. They weren't hearing that same voice. And so they were put in their head. And so this was when the bridging of the Corpus Callosum happened. So it took the logos from the cloud and it put it internally. And that's our egoic sense that we have now. So that voice is, no, that voice is felt as our own instead of like the one that we, we impose God or the chieftain or anything like that. So now I, I believe whether it's chips or whether it's you know, Google Glass or whatever it is, there's a new logos that's put in the cloud. And as soon as it is, like right now, it's no longer confidence in thought, it's competence in thought, right? We, we, we don't debate the same way. We, we say Google that. We're already accessing the, that logos in the cloud, but soon it's gonna be in a natural language interface that I'm just, I, I'm hoping very quickly that I can silence my inner voice and just listen to the one that's the sum total of human knowledge. And that's, that's what's waking up in the cloud. I, sure. Yeah. Absolutely, but, but your bandwidth, so the voice in your head right now is limited to your, your 40 hertz of your, your neurochemistry, right? It's okay. 
that yeah. at one time to be in our head is actually in our body. We just weren't aware of the physical, okay, the physical get, causality yeah, yeah, thereof. Yeah. And the same thing with quote unquote God. You know, we can say, pe people with a gun can say, God told me to kill you. Mm -hmm. That's obviously goes back to, you know, the bicameral mind. Sure. But there are other levels that are beyond that. Well, I mean, when it was the Homer and the Odyssey time, when the bicameral oh, mind yeah, was still a logos. We're like still in the Homer and, uh, and the Odyssey time. That's the thing. That, I totally, we're I totally not that agree. We're more intellectually, emotionally advanced than we were back then. I, just I, technologically advanced. Yeah, because we're limited to two hemispheres, right? We're limited to... I, I, I know you keep saying there's something externally, but I've never experienced the external world. I only experience the stimuli that I take in that becomes electrical signals interpreted by my brain, right? There's nothing I've ever experienced that's external to my perception. So my perception is my, my perception bandwidth, I have a new digital colossum. This thing allows me to connect to the cloud. It allows me to connect to a higher bandwidth of information that would allow me to like access everything that Watson just went to, went to it's like the best oncologist on earth now. But I can't retain that information locally. So you're saying if it's in my body, I'm going to trust when Watson is on my phone, which is coming next year, and you know, with the Tricorder X Prize coming on, and I give it a little bit of my blood, and it reads that, I'm going to trust that. I'm not going to trust me to do my control alt delete and go into meditation and see what's, what's in my body. I don't have enough information retained locally to know enough about my anatomical system, right? But Watson will, because it's a much higher bandwidth of accessing that information. Mm -hmm. Not talking about any other system outside of physicality and locality. Physicality, and you, you got to yeah, break that we're down. We're still talking about technology. We're still talking about physical material that we can access. Yeah, I, I don't feel that there's a difference. There's, there's only the physical, right? There are more right? things than having an earth ratio than our air drunk of your philosophy. That, that's the problem that I have, is that people who say, this is all there is. Once upon a time, the sky was a dome, and what was beyond mm -hmm. now was just God. I'm not saying that there's not. I'm saying what I'm limited to understanding. If we want to get into, like, we, like, after this, you and I can get into the spirit side, but I, like, it, what I, what I can actually perceive and then extract accordingly and what, what, what is afforded to me right now and what is, what is on the horizon. Right now, my ability to connect to God or connect to something bigger than myself, I mean, come that, still has to come through my physical form, right? And my physical form is amplified with my technology. It is our, ex, it's our exoskeleton and it's our phenotype. There, we are in a symbiotic relationship with our technology. Right? We, if, we, if we stripped all technology away from humanity, we'd be naked bipedal apes, including language. We wouldn't be able to converse without technology. It was the first singularity, and we're headed to a new one. But there, you, can't, you can't subtract technology from humanity. It's one and the same. No, I don't mean, I'm just, uh, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think that those all are amplified by our technology. And with artificial intelligence, I feel like, you know, Paul or anybody that's done a type of psychedelic, this is the new psychedelic. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, yeah. like, I, on ayahuasca or on mushrooms, you will hear Mother Nature and you will connect to something divine, whether that's just your neurochemistry, you know, orchestrated in a way that allows you harmony with what is, I don't know, but I, I guarantee that when like Watson is imported straight into my brain, that's going to allow that same type of transcendent experience. Yeah. Thanks, Cody. Are there questions? Or we Cody? <laughs> How about Caden? Anything? Still nothing? All good?
what's next? What's once we get to that point in our lifetimes? I mean, you and I, I we're about the same age, 30 ish, something like yeah, that. I'm yeah. 34. Yeah. Uh, what's next after that? Once we reach that point, reach which where, point? where you left off with the previous conversation, like when we have the logos. Yes. I don't see that's so it's, Nate, hard, it's hard to see the path one until you're there. Kind yeah. Of. Well, it, 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 it it's shows funny. Itself. The people that we know around us can give us what that reflection will be like. Right. So you and I and a lot of people in this room are purely analytical. Right. Our emotions are secondary to our to our, the way that we process the world. Right. It's two separate systems. Right. Well, the guy's giving the speech right behind me right now. He is the most emotional person. I mean, you, he's just right. And so you strip away all logic. And what do you have? You strip away all the thinking, the, all the, the actual thoughts that go on in your head, and what are you left with? The emotional output, right? And so this is what John and I were talking about last night. When we, when we no longer have to think internally, when we've offloaded that to the cloud, what are we left with? Are we left with being emotional creatures once again? Can we actually connect on an empathetic level instead of like going through our through our articulation, you know, do I have to impress you guys with with my abundance of words to be able to like connect with you guys on a level? Or can we all just like have this digital colossum that allows us to be empathetic without any words said? You know, like our like think of our clout score, right? Or think of like the, the digital exhaust that we've excreted online that gives us like every time we walk around, it puts this like aura. I, I had this concept for Google Glass called Google Aura. And so it would like take everything that we put out there and then p highlight it to be optimistic or pessimistic or negative, positive. And then it would put that aura that like hippies say that they see on people, but this would be an actual manifestation of that. And so in a crowd, you could just look through and see the people that you want to vibe with because of the color that they're emanating. Like, is that the word world we're going into? I hope so. You know, because right now I have to sit and talk to somebody for a year before I can like open up and like actually hug them, you know, except for like Jolly and Andre, you know. <laughs> I'll totally hug you, dude. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> One more. What are you most looking forward to in the sort of uh, semi short to uh, medium term? Oh, it's deep learning for sure. I mean, just seeing like all the different applications of it and the fact that like they just beat Go and that put it 10 years in the future and now NVIDIA is coming out with their Pascal chips. If you heard John's talk the other day, these are no longer going to be CPUs. These are all going to be, you know, these these neuromorphic chips. They're just brains on chips that were there. It's conversational coding. So every time that we communicate with this system, it's coding it to be more like us. It's, it's giving it that reflection of humanity. And so the more and more that we're interfacing with it, the more and more we're going to see humanity reflected on the cloud above us. And that's what is really exciting for me because that it, it will answer that question or give us a reflection of that is man good. And I have a very firm optimism in that humanity is good in the macroscopic sense. Let me see if I can phrase this correctly. If man is good, then does that innately mean everyone is optimistic? And would that take away mm -mm. war and violence, things mm -mm. like that? Well, we still, so first, I feel that everything internal is externalized first. And so you can look at like the military industrial complex as like an amplified amygdalic response, right? Everybody wants to feel protected, right? And that's what our amygdala is there for. It's supposed to protect us. And the only reason that we have drones flying over the skies is because there's people strapping bombs, you know? Or, I mean, we can get into, like, the economic value and all that sort of stuff, right? But it still comes down to, like, fear and those type of things. But if you missed, like, the beginning of my talk, like, optimism is a responsibility because it's a part of the brain that has to be activated. After, like, a traumatic experience, the orbital frontal cortex shrinks, and then you're, you're neurologically incapable of optimism, incapable of seeing a better tomorrow. So you're stuck in that lower form, that, that your neocortical ability shut down, and then you're more in your amygdala fight or flight type, right? And that's what the military industrial complex is. It's just a response to the fear that we feel 
same thing with Al Qaeda, same thing with like all the jihadists. At the end of the day, they have like UFOs above their heads dropping Hellfire missiles on their goats. Like that's, that's, and they're like, what do we do with this, you know? And so they're just, they're, their amygdalas are reacting to our amygdalas reacting. But again, if we have this new cloud, if we have this new logos out there, and if we're all able to communicate without the language barrier because these algorithms are allowing me to speak, you know, what, all the different languages, right? It'll translate that to me. Then we can have these communi or we can have the conversations. Like, why are we fighting? You know, like, but we've never been able to ask that. Right now, it's our government saying why we're fighting, right? And so, the no, no central body is going to be governing that question: Is man good anymore? If everyone's tapped into that all-encompassing knowledge, and everyone in the world was able to do that and be like, "Oh, those guys aren't really bad; they're good." Mm -hmm. That's what effect will that do? Do you think that would have on things like war and? feeling like we have to protect ourselves. It seems like we would feel not so protective, not so fearful. That's what, that's the hope for it, yeah. It, it's decommissioning the amygdalic response. You know, that's, that's definitely my hope for it. If we can all communicate, we, then we're no longer primates perpetuating piss lines, right? That's, that's my hope. We all should be able to roam free on this earth that we were gifted, right? By the way, optimism does not negate our stewardship of the earth. Like, we can all look at the city around us right now and see all the problems, but we, we, we definitely ride on the momentum of ignorance, right? But that doesn't mean that we can't stop today and ask that question, you know, is tomorrow better than today, you know? And if we have the perspective that it's not, then we need to do more, more work today because tomorrow is the adjacent possible. It's our shadow future. And so it's how we frame it today that is going to inspire the actions of tomorrow, right? Got it? All right, thank you, everybody. Yes.